Starting a restaurant is definitely pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. Growing up in Australia, like, I mean, I'd like to think there's a pioneering spirit in all of us. I was from Maitland, I uh, grew up in East Maitland. Yeah, we were a classic meat and three veg kind of family. I think mum and dad, when I told them that I was going to be a chef, they were, they were already well across the idea that, you know, they were going to have a son that was a chef. There was posters of chefs on my bedroom walls. I was 15. Started my apprenticeship, I think, two or three days before my birthday. To be the best at my craft that I can be was, I suppose, that underlying drive that I had. That's my ambition. My ambition is to make sure that people, next time they look at a fish, they see it differently. Like, I would have shut in the first 12 months if I didn't come up with a way of using every other part. simplicity of fish. There's very few other proteins that are as exacting as fish and that's part of the appeal for me. It's muscles of different parts of the fish and the eyes and the blood and the bones and scales and liver and parts. There's endless potential in a fish. We try to remove some of the noise out of our cooking. King George Whiting we've got on the menu tonight. We're crumbing it just before service and then we pan fry it in a pan using clarified butter. We don't deep fry it. The little tail's still on. The sauces that come with it are not touching the fish and we make all of them. So that's kind of the mantra that we follow here is don't mess with the actual products. Like people are coming here for the best fish. In the beginning there was all those considerations whether or not you put the token steak on the menu but then ultimately there's more restaurants than there ever has been in Sydney, let alone Australia. It came to me more as this level of confidence that I had where I'm like, I really want to do fish. I wanted people to always reference St. Peter if you want to try really beautiful Australian fish. One of the first dishes really born out of utilising the whole fish was the eye chip, uh, which was how do I get people to eat a fish eyeball? trying to adapt textures and change things and the perception and using nostalgia as a technique as well and trying to replicate a prawn chip that you would get at a Chinese restaurant that we would get as a kid. The dish to me that references mum champagne and those explosions of bubbles and pops and I suppose the celebration even is King George Whiting. We've taken what kind of citrus is in season and then we've added tapioca pearls, finger lime pearls and the roe from the fish in there. So what you end up with is a sauce that pops and explodes and, and is such a celebration moment. And I just think a glass of champagne with those bubbles and pops, it's like a next level dish. I think underlying everything is like a certain sense of legacy that you want to create, that you've come into a profession and you've set a new standard. It's not about where you end, it's how you begin. If you buy a fish that's four kilos and it yields two kilos worth of soft offal and bits and pieces, to put it in the bin um, would be foolish. So next to the roe, we have the heart and then the liver and the stomach and the spleen and then behind it we've got blood and scales that are all potential culinary applications that we can do. The heart and the spleen being more 
you know, iron rich and we salt them and then we dry them and sometimes smoke them and then we chop them by hand and put them through an exo sauce and then maybe cook that over charcoal. So we can diversify the technique and it's a fantastic way of experiencing offal maybe for the first time because it's not as if you're texturally confronted by blood and softness. The liver is probably my favourite uh, and probably the best entry level organ to try. Very similar to a duck liver, like foie gras, which is you know more like just butter and richness. Where we celebrate a cut of meat, like a ribeye of beef or a dry aged this or that, the same thing. Basically anything that you can conjure up in your head that's achievable with a cut of meat, then really you should be able to apply it to a piece of fish. And all the scales are pretty much still intact, there's no damage. It's got a nice bit of mucus on the outside of it, it's good fish. Farms serve a purpose and they create this moment throughout the whole year where you can have a consistent product. Whereas I like the variables that a wild fish offer. Like it's never perfect and when they are it's kind of a really exciting moment. Working in such a high stress kitchen, it's really hard. We've got incredible staff, but if you don't create a sustainable lifestyle for them, then they'll probably leave the profession. So we've adjusted our rostering system with four days on and three days off. And then in a six week cycle, we send away everybody for a full week. Marrying my wife and having three children are all, you know, nothing surpasses that have shifted my thinking, shifted the way that I, I am as a person. To keep myself going is, you know, seeing the kids every day, dropping them off at school, um, seeing my wife maybe before she goes to bed. <laughs> Just watching how they eat, what they find yucky. It's fascinating and that really gives insight into that level of humility that you need to bring to food to remain normal and grounded and cook for real humans that really enjoy nice things. <laughs>